The Spanish elections last December created a new political crisis within the Spanish state. The PP was the largest party but lost its majority. The Socialist Party, PSOE, was only a single point ahead of the radical grouping Podemos, which came very close to becoming the official opposition in the Spanish parliament. And in fourth place uh, was the right-wing citizens group, Ciudadanos, uh, which did worse than the media had been predicting. But the fact that no new government has been formed and the Pepe, the right government led by Rajoy, uh, is still in office has created a great deal of unease and unhappiness throughout the country. I think that the desire of the population or a majority of the population is for a new government. But what sort of government, what alliances, what policies, and is there anything that Podemos could have done that they didn't do? With me to discuss this is Luke Stobart, a Spanish uh, researcher uh, working in Spain and on Spanish affairs, who we have spoken to on the world today a number of times before. Luke, welcome. Hi. Um, how do you see the situation today? Let's start with today, where there is no new government and the PP is still in power, despite the fact that it doesn't have an overall majority. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I see the situation as one of the political establishment uh, almost paralysed again. Um, it's uh, a situation which is not totally different from what happened in Catalonia. Um, over the Catalan elections, where there was so much anger towards the right-wing parties and uh, also the social democratic parties that have performed the same kind of austerity politics and been just as corrupt. You um, mean the Catalan equivalents of these? I'm talking here on the Spanish level uh, and, and in Catal Catalonia. You can see clearly that People really want a, a change, not just a change of government, not just a change of faces, but a change of policies, a change to people's lives. I mean, the crisis is, is getting worse. Um, and also, they're, 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 they're refusing to support any kind of deal um, with, with the traditional uh, parties. parties. They want to break. Um, and that's an interesting uh, change because it means actually coalition governments are very hard to forge. Despite the fact that the EU establishment was putting a lot of pressure on the socialists, Pasoi, to form a grand coalition as they've set up in Germany and have tried for in other places, Pasoi refused. Now, is one reason they refused is that already having done very badly, they feared that if they went into a coalition with the right, they might be obliterated politically. Obviously, they've seen what's happened to uh, the PASOK party in Greece, um, you know, their, 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 their political uh, reference in Greece, um, which has collapsed uh, because of its uh, entry, entering into grand coalitions with right-wing parties. And uh, they're learning from that experience. At the same time, they're not, not just under pressure from the European leaders, but also from powerful economic uh, forces in, in Spain. It actually looked, uh, just after the New Year, as if um, it looked like uh, Pedro Sánchez, the leader of the social, social Democrats in Spain, was actually preferring to do some kind of deal with Podemos. But he was under a lot of pressure from uh, big business, um, from the media. And from within his own party. Of course, because there's uh, an, an old guard in his party. I mean, Pedro Sánchez is obviously someone who has, has tried to uh, win support on the, on the basis of the idea that we're going to renew the political establishment, but through one of the traditional parties. But in his party, there are people that actually, uh, particularly regional leaders, but also- In Andalusia especially especially in Andalusia, led by Susana Diaz, um, and also uh, old, old uh, you know, previous presidents like Felipe González have been uh, putting a lot of pressure 
um, for, uh, on, on, on Sanchez to do a deal um, with the other parties and not with Podemos. I mean, the kind of approach has been anything but Podemos. That's been the, the message. Uh, I think Sanchez couldn't uh, has, or hasn't been able to um, accept doing a deal with the Conservatives. Perhaps the one thing that actually allows the Socialists to continue to be, you know, actually the second biggest party in Spain is this kind of idea, which is more... Uh, uh, more an image than reality of being a, 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 a left alternative to the right, that there is some difference between right and left. And of course, they there know isn't. that there's very little. I mean, you know, in, 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 I mean, some, in some... Culturally, probably there is, but in <clears throat> social economic policies, uh, the political approaches to the EU and NATO, there's nothing to mm. choose between mm. them. And both the old guard of the Socialist Party was completely corrupt. Mm. You know, as corrupt as the right is today. Right. So I can see why the Felipist wing, which is very strong in Andalusia, is keen to do a deal. Mm. But couldn't they, couldn't they just organize a conference and get rid of Sanchez? I mean, I, after all, he's a sort of not a major figure with a big base of his mm. own. I mean, it looks like there's going to definitely be uh, elections in June. Um, under and, and Sanchez will remain the lead. He's going to be under a lot of pressure from the old guard to uh, maybe even resign. We can't predict everything that's going to happen. It's going to depend on, on what the polls are saying. At the moment, the polls aren't being published. It's not very clear why not. There's a lot of political use of polling going on in Spain, and there has been for a while. He's tried to present the deal with Ciudadanos as... Uh, an example that his party is willing to work with new forces and to renew the political uh, system in Spain. That's something that Ciudadanos, which is a, 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 a very conservative, very right-wing party, but is one that actually um, speaks about uh, the problem of the two-party system and the need to overhaul that and the need to bring in all sorts of controls to, against corruption and nepotism. And so actually doing a deal with them can make the Socialist Party look differently cleaner. to what it is. Yeah, cleaner, exactly. Um, it also puts Podemos uh, on the back foot because they're trying to present, um, they're, they're trying to present uh, Podemos as being the party that is stopping getting rid of the Conservatives. And they're obviously doing that for electoral reasons, thinking about how to marginalise Podemos in the, in the June elections. Yeah. On the yeah. other hand, Podemos, uh, which did very well in the elections, is nonetheless currently split mm. on the level of its leadership, mm. on the level of certain regional currents within Podemos uh, demanding more autonomy, not liking the commandist way in which Podemos uh, is run. There is a great deal of unease in the way in which the two principal leaders of Podemos, uh, uh, Pablo Iglesias and Inigo Erejon, uh, decided on who should be a member of parliament and not. So how is this going to be sorted out, Luke, in your opinion? Obviously, the, we can't know all the conversations that are going on behind closed doors in the Podemos leadership. There was definitely a decision after the Vista Alegre conference to opt for uh, a very moderate model of Podemos that uh, talked about corruption and tended to leave social issues to one side. Uh, this was understood as the way of winning over the centre voter, um, and even right-wing voters. There was a, this whole idea that we, we were a transversal party. And this was Inigo Erejón's um, approach, and uh, that very much dominated the apparatus of the organisation. There was, since June last year, it was quite clear that people like Juan Carlos Monedero, who was like the number three of Podemos, and to a, in a more nuanced way, Pablo Iglesias himself, were not happy with this turn. Actually, it coincided with a fall in support, quite considerable fall in support for Podemos, particularly on the left of the political spectrum. It also coincided with the kind of emptying out of the circles. The masses of uh, activists just stopped participating. Uh, some new people came in, but it certainly didn't uh, replace the, the, the large numbers that left. And by the summer, it was clear that Podemos was 
having problems, that this, this quick, uh, uh, you know, th th this kind of strategy of, of reaching the Moncloa in, within one year was not going not to work. And since then, there's been a push, I think, from Iglesias' camp to do things a bit differently. Mm. Um, when I say a bit, actually, it's substantially differently on, on some, on, in some ways. It's still a top-down model, but it's one that tends to be more open to work with other forces. So in places like Catalonia and in Galicia and other uh, <coughs> na historic nations or regions of Spain, uh, there's been um, alliances which have stood uh, with much broader forces, um, and they've actually done much better than Podemos. This is the elections. interesting thing, that wherever they have combined with other forces on the left, or other progressive forces, they have done much better than where they stood in their own, pretending to be neither left nor right. Mm. And this obviously has... Uh, uh, strategic consequences for a serious party leadership. Mm. You have to say, why is it that this happens? And mm. we know why. It's obvious people want the left united. Mm. Uh, which is why uh, sort of depriving the anti-capitalist movement within of members of parliament, I think, was very short-sighted. Mm. They would have been a strong force mm. for preventing any foolish compromises with the mainstream parties. I mean, there's definitely a shift. Um, the new organization secretary uh, of the party is Pablo Echenique, uh, who's a disabled MEP. He was, alongside anti-capitalistas, um, the, the most kind of visible face of the fight to have a more democratic Podemos at the Vista Alegre conference. And it's very interesting that Pablo has Effectively, and again, this is a bit of the top-down culture. He's kind of, you know, appointed him from the, from the top and said, you know, I can do that. I'm the general secretary. That's what it says in the statute. But he's also said, I want you to be as you are. I want you to be critical. I want you to. I don't want you to adapt um, to to the to the party structures. And at the same time of these organisational changes, there's clearly a change in discourse. Uh, Pablo's uh, speech um, when Ciudadanos and the PSOE. Um, reached their agreement and there was a discussion about whether there should be a new government invested. Um, Pablo was really hard on the whole of the political establishment in a way that we haven't seen since the beginning of Podemos and it was quite electrifying to watch. Um, this was a speech in Parliament? This was a speech in Parliament. I mean he even accused uh, Felipe González of uh, being behind the death squads in the Basque country. Well in the he 1980s, was, we know that. But to say, but no that the, to say that in the Spanish Parliament when you're negotiating very with that same party um, is uh, you know bold and I think a very welcome turn um, and the media have made a lot of Inigo Edajon's facial uh, very unhappy facial expressions while Pablo was giving that speech um, and there's more clearly as you've alluded to a more clear identification with the, the, the left and its history, you know, celebrating the, the fights against Franco. Clearly, you know, Podemos is now, through Pablo, trying to reorientate itself as a, as a broad left party. Um, of course, you know, there's all sorts of other questions about, uh, you know, how you operate in government, um, how you deal with you know, the European forces, how you try and tackle the, the Troika. I'm not suggesting that this change is enough to necessarily be successful in, on all of those levels, but it's certainly something I think that can mobilize people because the, you know, even though employment has started to grow, which is one reason why the Conservatives still managed to come first in the elections, and there has been an increase in, in job creation, Really, the, the perspectives are for around 20% unemployment for the, for the next, you know, five, five, six years. If not more. Possibly more. Um, at the moment, 40% of the population earn between 500 and 900 euros, which is absolutely incredible. That's a result of not just austerity, but bringing in labour reforms, which reduce the power of the unions which increase insecure working contracts. And in Spain, there was already massive use of insecure working contracts. And people are not going to, you know, they're, they're not looking for some tinkering of the system. They're not just looking for new faces. They, they want, want structural a, a radical change. Yeah. What has surprised me a bit, <coughs> though not too much, 
was that after the huge, disgraceful capitulation by Tsipras mm. and the Syriza leadership, a majority of that leadership, the Podemos leaders were very supportive. They mm. remained supportive yeah. of Tsipras. And surely, I mean, even purely from a immediate tactical point of view, that wasn't a very clever thing to do because the whole of Europe saw what had happened. Mm. Syriza won a referendum to take on the EU and within 24 hours of that victory, Syriza said, we're not going to do anything, we're going to capitulate, defying his own people and accepting the EU. So why the hell did Iglesias and Erion? Erion, I can understand, he's a sort of deeply opportunist figure, but why did Iglesias at that point not say this is unacceptable? It's a good question. I don't have a complete answer to that. I mean, I, I myself was very disappointed watching some of the TV programmes that... Um, that Pablo uh, hosts, where there was quite a long um, defence of the Suiza government and no real criticism. Um, and in after the, end, the capitulation. This was after the capitulation and this was after um, Suiza got re-elected as well in September. Um, and one of the things they said was, there's limits to what you can do as, as a government. Now, that's okay to draw that conclusion, as long as you're looking for a way of overcoming those limits. You know, Podemos, if it perhaps had more roots in the, in the, in the neighbourhoods and in the unions and, and, and in social movements, then it could use that, in, use that relationship to encourage struggles, to act as a, a lever and, and, and back up a government bringing in contentious policies. But there wasn't a discussion about that. It was more of a pragmatic and a pessimistic discussion about the limits of, of how radical you could be in government. This was very disappointing. This was also before the turn towards some of the old rhetoric. I also think that there's a, a mistaken idea that the way of fighting the powers internationally, financial uh, forces and uh, leaders of the big states, is through alliances with other more or less left-wing states. And of course, even though Suiza is bringing in austerity, it would seem see, be seen to be a potential ally in that struggle. These kind of discussions have taken place in Latin America as well. This isn't a new debate. No, but in Latin America, the big difference is that you did have, and you still do, uh, three countries on very closely aligned. Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador. The, the, this trio of countries was effectively the heart of Bolivarianism. Venezuela, of course, we know is under heavy pressure after the defeat, parliamentary defeat, but Ecuador and Bolivia are still there. And Brazil was never part of the Bolivarian movement in any case. So yeah. that was a deal to unite on many issues they made after they had come to power, not before, though the argument was being put forward, this is what we're going to do. In as far as Syriza is concerned, it's the exact opposite. You know, basically, they capitulate without a struggle, without a fight. They don't look at any other alternatives. Mm. It now becomes clear, Varoufakis uh, says it openly, that uh, Tsipras really was shocked when they won. Mm. He thought they would lose the referendum. Mm -hmm. To be so behind your own people is sort of political bankruptcy, unless you know that's what you really wanted secretly, mm. but then you enter the realms of conspiracy theory. The question is this, that given the scale of the capitulation, for Pablo Iglesias, who's an intelligent guy, mm. not to see that, mm. I think they're beginning to see it a bit more now, given the situation mm. in Greece, which is like a EU colony. There's mm. nothing they can do on mm. their own. But let's move on from there, sure. Luke. Let's, <clears throat> because you know, discussing Spain these days, you can't discuss it as a unitary force. Mm. So it's like in Britain, you have to discuss Scotland separately from yeah, England. <clears throat> um, what is happening in Catalonia? There too we had 
the victory of a you know, party of bourgeois nationalism, the right, and a strong COP mm. presence. And there things turned out differently, didn't they? Or not? I mean, what's different about Catalonia is that there's been a, a, a very mass movement that's continued to stay on the streets after the 15th of May Indignados protests, um, calling for independence. And that's driven the whole of the Catalan political party system forward. Um, it's forced a certain change uh, in the large Catalan nationalist party, Convergencia y uh, Unión, it actually split, and now it's only called Convergencia, which decided to support the call for independence. Um, actually, if you scratch the surface, that party, which is a, a big business party, yeah. um, it's got very powerful links. It's, it's the party of the Catalan bourgeoisie. Yeah. Um, that party is clearly willing to do a deal if a deal were, were offered. But they're Madrid. not being offered. They're not being offered a deal. So the process is continuing through the Catalan institutions. Um, there was elections which were effectively a plebiscite on independence. Um, and the pro-independence parties won? They won. They didn't get 50% of the votes, and so there's been a bit of a discussion as to if this was a plebiscite, can that be understood to be the referendum was passed, because you'd normally need 50%. Um, obviously, it wasn't exactly a referendum, because the Spanish state, the courts and the government has prevented have opposed, a referendum. Yeah. So we can't know exactly if there would have been a slightly different vote in a, in a referendum. But they're, they're also, um, it's also the case that the parties clearly opposing Catalan independence won l a lot less. There was the Podemos coalition actually has an ambiguous position uh, on this question. So actually there was clearly a larger percentage saying yes to independence than those clearly saying no to independence. So in the last few months, the, the process to win Catalan sovereignty uh, or nationhood uh, has continued. Um, that's been as fraught as the negotiations over the Madrid government. Um, it actually, in the end, depended on an anti-capitalist party, La Coupe, which is pro-independence. Um, they actually had held the key to whether uh, a pro-independence president could, could end up taking office. And they office. voted for that? They did. They, they were under enormous pressure to do that um, from a lot of the street movement has and to be their seen. own base. Some of their base. The base was split. I mean, they had massive um, assemblies where uh, at well, one point it was it, it, it actually, at one point they actually had a vote with thousands of people, and it was an exact tie. Which uh, it was have, an exact tie um, with it among in front of thousands of people. Exactly, and with the international media watching. Um, I think a well, Financial Times uh, columnist uh, complained that how can the future of Catalonia be decided by the an assembly of a few thousand anti-capitalists? <laughs> um, which, you know, for, for, for many people I think was a, a great amazing. thing to see. Yeah. Um, and it's a sign of the times that that's, that that's occurring. Um, they did a deal, they did a deal on the basis that Artur Mas, the right-wing Catalan president, would step aside and which he has. He did which he has, which, you know, is a victory of one sort. But they also signed uh, a deal which meant that they would support the stability of the Catalan government, which is dominated by right-wing bourgeois forces. Yeah. And there's this weird situation in Catalonia where you have, in the Catalan government, you have Podemos criticising the coup for having allies with the bourgeoisie, and in the Barcelona town hall, you have the coup attacking Podemos, uh, sorry, the, the, the um, Ada Colau's, uh, you know, uh, organisation which in includes uh, Podemos, the wide, it's a wide coalition, for not supporting strikers and depending on which parliament you're in, they swap over from being the left critics to, to being the, you know, the, the sellouts, you could call it. So that is Catalonia. What about the Basque Country? Is mm -hmm. the deal finally being done now with the release of one of their most important leaders of the armed resistance? Sure. I'm not an expert on the Basque no. Country. I mean, I'll just say briefly, 
uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, everything that's happening in Catalonia is, is going to have a, an impact on the Basque Country. There's going to be elections this year, which should be quite interesting. Um, there's been a, a degree of institutionalization of the left nationalists movement in the Basque Country, much more so, I think, than in Catalonia. Uh, that's perhaps been one of the reasons why they've actually lost some support in the last few years. They were doing incredibly well in the elections a few years ago. But obviously the struggle for independence is being encouraged by events in Catalonia. Um, so there's many fronts, I'd say, that you know, uh, have opened for the Madrid government and would open for any different government that took office after, June, after the June elections, assuming, mm. assuming that no deal is done. Let's say there is a June election and let's say the voting remains more or less the same. Perhaps Podemos goes down a point or two. It'll be the status quo again. Or do you think that's, that this time people will decide possibly to punish Podemos for not creating an alternative government? And <clears throat> Ciudadanos and Pesoy will increase their votes. The PP, I can't see them winning. But the others, I mean, the left might suffer as a result of this. There, there, is, there are so many question marks. Yeah. Uh, it's difficult to, to predict things. I mean, what I would say is that one possibility, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why the Conservatives are sticking with their leader, even though... 90% of Spani Spaniards are saying he should move to one side yeah. because one of the reasons why Ciudadanos and the Conservatives didn't come to an agreement was because the... Because, because Rajoy wouldn't move. Exactly. But, but one uh, intelligent analysis that I've read by a, a, a guy who calls himself a right-wing Gramscian, uh, en Enrique Juliana, one of the most talented journalists I've ever come across. Which paper? Van La Vanguardia, which is a Catalan paper. Um, his uh, analysis is that the Conservatives are holding on, hoping that the pressure from all these different forces that we've talked about on the Socialists to come to some grand coalition actually will force their hand eventually by the summer, yeah? assuming that the election results are more or less what they were in, in December. Um, and if that's the case, you will see Podemos playing an opposition role against the whole of the, ma the mainstream political establishment. I think in the long term, that might be quite interesting. Yes, but um, surely, Luke, if Pesoy are going to crumble and cave into a national government, at the very least, they'll demand a new leader, not Rajoy. I mean, if Ciudadanos was demanding that, why should Pesoy be outmaneuvered by them? In which case, the uh, Pepe will have to decide, mm. you know, on that and possibly even accept a neutral leader, mm. from, neither from Pesoy or the Pepe, but from Ciudadanos. Mm. I mean, all these things are being discussed. Of course. Happens. And what we saw in the Catalan case was that a deal between La Coupe and uh, Junts pel Si, which is the other big pro-independence bloc, the much bigger bloc, uh, was actually looking like it wasn't going to happen. But in the last 10 days, of course, people start looking at the, the polls and saying, if we have new elections, will we be worse off? That was the calculation in Catalonia, that actually the pro-independence vote would go down. And they rushed to do a deal. Now, of course, depending on what the polls are saying in April or May, hmm. you could find there could be all sorts of last-minute last minute manoeuvres to try and avoid new elections. Hmm. Um, I think what's really interesting and positive is that the way things have shifted in Podemos, um, despite the fact that obviously Podemos is weakened because it seemed to be internally divided and not particularly transparent about these divisions, they're setting themselves up to be the opposition. And I think in the long term that would be a very important thing and I think it's something that actually Iglesias and other people in Podemos do very well. Let's hope you're right. On that note, Luke, we, we will watch out for what happens in Spain in the coming months. Thanks. It's going to be very exciting, I'm sure. Thank you.